Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and people who don't identify as either one. You are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. Happy Pride, everyone. It is June. We are celebrating the LGBTQ plus community. I've seen your rainbows up and down my social media timelines. You look beautiful, as always. I know the parades and such, a lot of them have been canceled. And a lot of the Pride events are still virtual because of COVID. I hope you get a good celebration in for this month and beyond. Because I hate it when folks be like, oh, it's Black History Month. And like, that's the only month y'all can talk about Black folks' accomplishments. No, no. It doesn't apply to Black History Month and it doesn't apply to Pride either. So celebrate extra, extra big for June. And you could just be extra for the other 11 months. So much going on. But before we jump into it, I want to make a correction to, I think, last Friday's episode. We talked about the return of Sex in the City. I said that Christopher Noth, Mr. Big, would not be returning to the series. And that was incorrect. In fact, he will be returning to Sex in the City. So I guess Carrie's still married? Maybe? Who knows? I don't know what they're coming up with. I'm a little skeptical about this reboot. I told you I was going to give it a try. But I'm less skeptical than when I thought Mr. Big and Samantha would both not be returning. But Mr. Big is back, so I'm less skeptical, still skeptical. But I just wanted to make that correction. i got a bunch of stuff going on, but in my downtime, I've been watching some documentaries, and I read a really great book. My friend Tia Williams, we used to be Essence editors at the same time. She's got a new book out it's called Seven Days in June. And I'm slated to be in conversation with her tomorrow. Well, today, when you hear this, I'm recording on Thursday evening. So I picked up her new book because I was like, you know, I should have some idea of this story before I talk to her virtually. So I picked up the book last night around nine o'clock or so. And I'd only intended to read maybe like 50 or so pages just to get a gist. I, you know, I read that whole book. I read for a few hours until I was like dog tired. So I put the book down and I woke up this morning at 530 and reached onto the nightstand, grabbed the book and finished the whole thing this morning. Like I was done by 830 this morning. I could not put it down. I was so enthralled. I was like just a little bit more. I just need to know what happens after this thing happens because this thing was wild. And these people and these characters, (sighs) it's a love story. It's about two folks trying to figure it out. And it should be so simple. Unfortunately, it is not. Not in the real world and not in this book either. But these people, very lovable and likable, but also very flawed folks, just trying to get through life, figure it out, and love each other. It's a really good story. I know a lot of people have been complaining about quote and unquote trauma porn in black art a lot lately. And it's a fair critique in some ways. But this book is not that. It's not that at all. It's, um, I don't want to give anything away. It's about two authors who fell in love quickly in their youth and they, and they reunite as grown ups. It's really good. I love, love, love the hero. He's kind of a bad boy, quote and unquote stereotype, but he's also got a lot of goodness to him as well. So if you're looking for something good to read, if you're traveling again, if you're headed to the beach, you're doing a staycation, or you just need to unwind on a weekend. Seven Days in June is a really good escape. I can't wait to, to dive into this book with Tia tomorrow. If you'd like to tune into the conversation, it's hosted by Cafe Con Libros out of D.C. And I'll post the information in my Instagram stories. If you'd like to register for the event, it's free. If you'd like to hear Tia and I in conversation tomorrow. But congratulations to Tia on her latest, and I'm calling it for her, bestseller. Tia's got a lot of good things going on for her right now. Her previous book, the book before this one, was called The Perfect Find, and it's being adapted by Netflix for a film starring Gabrielle Union. I can't wait for that either. Congratulations, Tia. I love to see folks on the glow up. I told you I've been watching a lot of documentaries. One of them is this Tyson documentary. I think it's from ABC, but I watched it on Hulu. Only the first two parts are up. I don't know how many they are to go, but I grew up during the height of Mike Tyson, but I was a kid. Like, I remember the fights on pay-per-view, and my dad would have parties in the basement, and we'd have all these people over, and, and he'd pay all this money to watch the fight. 
and they would last like 90 seconds. And I remember like the Tyson hysteria and Mike Tyson's punch out on Nintendo, I think. And I guess because, you know, like I was so young and I didn't know anything different. I thought it was just totally normal that, you know, a black guy is the heavyweight champion of the world and he gets a Nintendo game and he's like this international mega superstar. This is also in the era of, you know, Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan. So I was like, oh, it's normal. But ABC points out just how abnormal actually Tyson's fame was. And they get into some details about his life, which I was like, wait, what? People talk a lot about him getting arrested multiple times and being sent to a boy's home. And then he ended up with Ali's coach when he was like 12 or 13. I knew about the coach because I read Mike Tyson's autobiography when I was in sixth grade. So I was like 10. It was another one of those books, like Waiting to Exhale, that my mother had laying around the house. So I picked it up and read it. And, you know, of course, I didn't understand all of it because the documentary references some things he said in the book. And I was like, that's crazy. But it didn't sound crazy to my 10-year-old brain. <laughs> Why did my mother let me read that? I guess she just wanted me to read. She figured if I was laying on the couch, I wasn't outside causing chaos. But still. But there's a, a part in the documentary that talks about one of Tyson's trainers was fired for putting a gun to his head and then moving it at the last second and firing into the ceiling, I think. It turns out that the trainer was married and his wife had a younger sister who was 11 and Tyson, who was about, I guess, somewhere between 17 and 19 at the time, grabbed the little girl's butt and the trainer's retaliation was to, you know, put a gun to his head. And I was like, well, you know, folks got to do what folks got to do. And not, I mean, in terms of the trainer, not Tyson grabbing a child. But it sounds like a crazy story, right? Would Mike Tyson do that? He admitted to it. Like there's a quote from him saying that like, yeah, I did it. It was stupid. And I knew it was dumb as soon as I did it. And I was like, I mean, you think? You molested a kid. So the whole first part of the documentary goes through Tyson's rise to becoming heavyweight champion of the world and all the perks and the money. It talks about his short-lived marriage to Robin Givens as well, which again, I remember all of this stuff from being a kid. And I remember Robin Givens being portrayed as this horrible gold digger. She and her mother were like the worst people on the planet and they were using Mike Tyson for his money. And I remember the outrage over that interview with Barbara Walters where Robin Givens was like, you know, he's manic depressive and he shakes me, which literally Mike Tyson had said like earlier in the interview, Barbara Walters asked him, people say that you hit your wife. You know, are you are you abusing your wife? And he was like, no, he was like, I would never hit my wife. Do I hold her? Do I shake her? Yeah. Like, and he just said it like so plainly. And then Robin Givens follows up and point blank confirms it. And she was so villainized for that. And I know I'm looking at this through like, you know, 2021 eyes as opposed to the 1990s. But I'm just like, wait, like a man just got on national TV and said that he holds his wife, blocks exits and shakes her like he says he did it. And then she comes on and says, yeah, he does it. And she's the problem. Really? Many episodes ago, we talked about that documentary. I think it's on HBO about Britney Spears. And the documentary is mostly about her inability still to control her, her finances. Her father is in control of all of her earnings. But part of that documentary goes back and it looks at the breakup of Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears and how he vilified her and how he publicly talked about their sex life, which went against the image she created as this wholesome virginal girl and how he launched his whole career making this video with a Britney lookalike, which heavily implied that she cheated on him. So in order to get this come up, he vilifies his ex-girlfriend. And at the time, everyone just went along with it. Justin Timberlake ended up issuing an apology, both to Britney Spears and to Janet Jackson for the Super Bowl thing. Because again, he ripped the piece off of her clothing that exposed her breast. But Janet was the one that got heavily punished, even though Justin was the active participant. Like he ripped something off of her, she is exposed, and then she is punished for a man exposing her. It never did make sense. But people blamed her nonetheless. Janet's currently working 
on her own documentary. There was an announcement about it earlier this year. So her story is going to be reframed. But I was like, perhaps we need a reframing of Robin Givens' story as well. Because Mike Tyson sat in that interview and he said, no, I don't, I don't hit her. He later went on Oprah and was like, yeah, like, you know, we socked each other. And then there's that infamous quote from his book. I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like the best hit he ever threw was punching Robin and she bounced off all four walls. He beat that lady's ass. And then folks were like, oh, she's making him look bad. She's tearing down this black man. Should she not? He's beating her ass. That scenario, our framing, our cultural framing of Robin Givens, because she had to disappear for a really long time. Like she was persona non grata. She was hated. She just, like within like the last like three years or so, started working in high profile projects. She got a raw deal. The Tyson documentary also talks about uh, Desiree, the beauty queen that he was convicted of raping. I still don't know what to make of that one. I remember at the time, the conversation in the beauty shop with the grown women. Why did she go to his hotel room at 2 a.m. if she didn't want to have sex? And, you know, Mike Tyson could have any woman he wanted. He doesn't have to rape anyone. That's how people were still framing rape in the 90s. People still frame it that way 30 years later. But there's also a loud opposition that would say, just because I go to your hotel room at any time of day doesn't mean... I'm consenting to have sex. It means I'm going to your hotel room. I might be thinking about it. I might be considering it, but it's not consent. Like you don't have consent until I say yes. But the documentary, um, it makes that rape charge, that rape conviction as hazy today as it was then. They don't take a definitive stance on whether Tyson actually did it, even though he was convicted of doing it. There is a great journalist in the documentary, though, who talks about how black women are often silenced or remain silent in order to protect black men because historically they've gotten a raw deal, especially with white women making false accusations about rape charges. But she was like, okay, but this situation wasn't a white woman. It was a black woman. And we're still, we're knee jerking like, oh, she must be lying because she's a woman. She talks about how we prioritize men, black men specifically. It's a really good doc. I'm looking forward to the third series. I think it comes out on Sunday nights. It pops up on Hulu on Sunday nights. It may air earlier. There's two great docs coming down the timeline. You know, I make those lists of TV and film and documentaries, what's Demi watching. I haven't put up one in a while. I need to, but I put together a list kind of recently and a bunch of stuff that's coming wasn't on the list. A lot of stuff gets advertised at the last minute. And one of those is a Mary J. Blige documentary on the making and meaning of my life, which I was like, woo, you know how I feel about Mary J. Blige. Like I love, 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 love Mary J. Blige. I've seen her concerts, usually at Essence Festival. You know, at one point I was complaining. I was like, look, I've seen Mary J. Blige so many times. Really Essence, like every year, Mary J. Blige is gonna close. It used to be Frankie Beverly and Mays, and then it moved to Mary J. Blige. And I was like, ah, oh, do you know what I would give right now for Essence Festival without having to wear a mask in New Orleans? And to be in an arena with 60,000 other people watching Mary J. Blige, I wouldn't give you my right arm because that's what I type with. But maybe like my left pinky. Just the tip. Just the tip. <laughs> but I cannot wait to see that. It's being executive produced by Sean Combs. He puts together good documentaries. That bad boy documentary was amazing. I expect nothing else for this Mary documentary. Lord knows there's enough story there. Because Mary's shared a lot, but there's also a lot that she hasn't shared. So we'll see. I'm definitely looking forward to that. I'm going to get my box of tissues out for that one, too. Because Mary, Mary moves me. There's also an Anthony Bourdain documentary coming, which I had no idea was in the works. I'm, I'm not even going to put the box next to me. I'm going to just take the tissues out and put them on my lap. I, I loved that dude. I cried like somebody I knew had died when I heard that he had killed himself. I boo-hooed. And I want to say it was like right after, like literally, like maybe like two or three days after Kate Spade had committed suicide. So we were all like wrestling with that. And it's not that Kate Spade was like this larger than life figure, but she was going through a divorce. She was a mom. She left this letter blaming her, I guess, estranged husband 
Like it was a mess and it was just horrible and terrible because, you know, Kate Spade always presented as happy and all pulled together and here are these beautiful dresses and it was just one of those, you never know what people are going through. So people were talking about that. And then three days later, Anthony Bourdain killed himself. And I was like, oh my God, his travel show, his like, what seemed to be this, this love for food and love for life and love for people and this, you know, inquisitiveness. But to find out that he'd been suffering all along and that, you know, he just finally reached his peak and ended it, oh, gutted me. But there's a documentary coming out about Anthony Bourdain and there's tons of footage because, you know, we only got an hour or so, but to put together an hour of television is a whole lot of footage left on the floor. So I'm definitely looking forward to that as well. I'm going to need all the tissues and all the water because I will cry myself into dehydration. I've done it before. I love that dude. Ugh, it's going to get me, but I'm going to watch this documentary. It's in theaters. I got to go on like a Monday in the middle of the day when no one's there because I'm still not really ready to pretend COVID doesn't exist. Even like fully vaccinated, I'm still not ready to like be around people and be out, out, all in public sitting next to strangers. I'm just saying. While TV has been a saving grace for many of us, I'm sure by now a lot of you feel like you've caught up on every single show imaginable. If you're tired of scrolling through the same movies or shows and miss the excitement of weekly releases and brand new binge fest, then you have to get Acorn TV. Acorn TV is the largest commercial-free British streaming service that features compelling stories, exclusive premieres, and originals you won't find anywhere else. With Acorn TV, there's always something new to discover. It has hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world, including award-winning mysteries, dramas, comedies, and so much more. And Acorn TV has new releases every week, so you'll never have to worry about running out of content. From production to performances, the series you'll find on Acorn TV are exceptional and refreshing because they're cleverly written, visually striking, and feature renowned actors like David Tennant and Thandie Newton. They've also got this great show, Miss Fisher's Modern Murder Mysteries. A woman decides to follow in the footsteps of her very stylish aunt and become a lady detective. The New York Times calls this series Clever Crime Fair. You get thousands of hours of new enthralling content on Acorn TV for a fraction of the cost compared to most streaming services at just $5.99 a month. Now, what I love about Acorn is the variety. There's a new show every week. It's impossible to run out of shows to watch. If you're ready for a streaming service that offers new stories, new characters, and breathtaking sceneries every week, do what I did and get Acorn TV. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and use my promo code, Ratchet. But you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV, code Ratchet, and get your first 30 days for free. The bonnet debate rages on. I'm so sick of talking about these goddamn bonnets. Monique did a second video where she doubled down on what she said initially about bonnets. I just, I'm so sick of talking about this shit. I do think it's notable that in the middle of all these conversations about black women and their bonnets and what's presentable and what's for public and what's for private and outside wear versus sleepwear and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a do-rag fest coming. I've, I've seen people make comparisons. Like all these men talk about bonnets, don't ever have anything to say about do-rags. But men wear their do-rags out in the street. You want your waves, right? It requires a certain number of hours. So y'all wear y'all do-rags out. Okay. There's never been some mass campaign against men and their do-rags. But in the midst of all this conversation about bonnets, there's a do-rag festival. It's not the first. It's an annual event. It's happening again on June 19th in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've heard not one word in opposition to this support of do-rags. I want to say Rihanna wore a do-rag to some event and it was considered stylish. Correction, she wore a do-rag on the cover of Vogue. 
I remember like white people started selling do rags for like two hundred dollars. It was like the next big thing. I even think about like little Nas when he performed on Saturday Night Live. His dancers had on flowing do rags. No one said a, a word. I, I heard nothing about the do rags. It's like, oh, how ghetto, how unpresentable, how terrible, like that sleepwear, that's houseware. Not one single word about the do rags. But I'm like, do rags are to men what bonnets are to women. You trying to keep your shit wavy. Women, they're trying to preserve whatever hairstyle is under the bonnet. Not a word about do rags. And I actually hope there isn't, because I feel the same way about do rags that I feel about bonnets. Like, the respectability politics will not save you. If you want to wear it, wear it. Is it sleepwear? Uh huh. Should it probably just be worn in the house? Yeah, uh huh. But if you wear it out, what difference does it make? Really? I wish folks would give bonnets the same, what's the word, indifference that they give do rags. I'm absolutely not saying drag the do rags. I'm saying leave the bonnets alone. That's what I'm saying. People always go harder for stuff against stuff when it involves black women. It's so, so exhausting. What else do we have going on? Naomi Osaka, the fallout from that continues. After Naomi bailed, and there was a huge backlash about how they handled that situation, including a tweet. I would heard about a tweet that they put out, but I hadn't seen it when we recorded last week. Apparently, after Naomi said that she wasn't going to do press conferences because of her anxiety, the press conferences went on. She was fine. The official Roland Garros account, which is the French Open, posted a graphic of other athletes at their press conferences. And the caption was, they understood the assignment. And I was like, are you serious? It's not like she said, I don't want to do it just because I don't feel like doing it. She said it gave her anxiety and she was experiencing mental distress. And then you troll her from your official account? Really? So that was bad enough. And then, you know, they try to strong arm her into doing the press conferences. She quits. We all know the gist of that story. But in the midst of all the backlash, and there's been much... And, and some people, like Piers Morgan, has just been douchey as expected. Like he called Naomi spoiled brat, petulant brat, something like that. And I was like, sir, didn't you storm off your own live TV show a couple months back? Because the weatherman dragged the fuck out of you? You stormed off and then quit the next day. I think you were fired. But you stormed off your show. But she's a brat. Okay. The weatherman replaced him too. Weatherman is fine. Alex, there's a video of him hula hooping and the internet doing what it does, set it to some reggae and slowed it down. I was like, look now, I need to get some good morning Britain going on in my life. He's fine. That's not the point. The point is there's been international outcry about the way Naomi Osaka was treated and the French Open has backed down some. They haven't outright apologized. They did do a press conference explaining that Naomi left And then didn't take questions afterward. They read a statement and then the spokesperson just bailed. And I was like, you don't want to deal with bullshit press conferences either. But you just find a 23-year-old with anxiety, no less, for not wanting to do what you don't want to do. But they did come back and said that they would be exploring their approach to athletes who are dealing with mental health conditions. Which, thank you. It shouldn't have had to take Naomi dropping out of the French Open for that to happen. But thank you. Jesus. But two people who have been very vocal in supporting Naomi, the Williams sisters, Serena and Venus. Serena caught a little flack. She gave a statement, which sometimes I think people just like to harp on Serena. But she did a press conference. She was asked about Naomi. And the first thing she said was, I feel like I wish I could give her a hug because I know what it's like. I've been in those positions. That was the first thing she said. And then she went on to say, Let me find the exact quote. She said, I feel for Naomi. Not everyone is the same. I'm thick. Other people are thin. Everyone is different and everyone handles things differently. You just have to let her handle it the way she wants to and the best way she thinks she can. That's the only thing I can say. I think she is doing the best she can. So a lot of people took issues with the I'm thick, Other people are thin. They didn't think that she had to say that. And they were like, it's more than being thin. 
She's dealing with mental health issues. That's not a thick thing or a thin thing. That's a health thing. I don't think it came out the right way, but I also feel that given Serena's history and her treatment of Naomi in the past, and also that in this moment, she was like, I just want to hug her. I think people should give her some grace. I was watching this video the other day. Naomi had beat Serena Williams at a major tournament. And at the ceremony, when the officials were handing out trophies, people were booing Naomi. And she's standing on the podium next to Serena. She had an advisor hat and she pulled it down over her eyes. And you can see the tears rolling down her cheeks. And Serena comforts her. And then when it's Serena's turn to take the microphone, she says, stop booing. She played a great game. You know, things obviously didn't turn out for me the way that I wanted, but she won and she's a champion and we should support her. If that ain't some graciousness, some compassion, some decency. And I was like, Serena knows what it feels like to be, you know, treated like shit by the fans. I've seen clips of Serena being booed like early in her career. It's not a good feeling. So I appreciate that in that moment, because she's got to be feeling her own stuff. She's a competitive athlete. You know, she showed up ready to win, giving her all to win. And she didn't. She's got her own feelings about loss. But even in that moment, she showed graciousness toward Naomi. So I wish people would give Serena just a little bit of leadway here. That maybe the way that she expressed herself wasn't the best. But I don't think she was taking a jab at Naomi. I think she was just saying people are different. She goes on to say somewhere else that she used the, the media scrutiny to her advantage. She let it fuel her, but everybody doesn't operate that way. And she's just acknowledging that, you know, Naomi's not her. She shouldn't be held to the Serena standard of how to handle the media. Venus Williams, I can't remember a time of Venus Williams lashing out at the press. Serena will put a little bass in her voice sometimes, but I feel like Venus, and again, I don't follow tennis super close, but I feel like Venus is like the quote and unquote like nice sister, the easygoing sister. But Venus has had enough. She was at a press conference the other day and they asked her, how do you handle dealing with press conferences? Obviously, it's a question that's you know, directly related to, to Naomi saying that she, she doesn't, that they give her anxiety. And Venus, you know, I'm just going to play it for you because the inflection matters. She was so calm and even. She just didn't give a fuck. How I deal with it was that I know every single person asking me a question can't play as well as I can and never will. So no matter what you say or what you write, you'll never let a candle to me. So that's how I deal with it. Venus is over it to the point that Venus isn't raising her voice. Venus isn't putting bass in her voice. Venus isn't cursing. Venus does not care. You've upset Venus Williams. She's so sweet, but she's had enough. She's had the fuck enough. I said on Instagram about Venus, I said, the fuck factory is barren. No more fucks are being produced. Venus is full out of fucks to give. Stop playing with these people. Stop playing with these people. Like you handled the situation wrong. You bullied a 23 year old with anxiety and depression issues. Like just apologize. Let Naomi go get the help that she wants and needs. However long that takes. And we'll see her again. Maybe. Maybe. If she feels like it. There was a tennis player. Uh, God, what is his name? Is it McEnroe? I was reading this article earlier today. John McEnroe, tennis god, tennis legend, went on a podcast. And he was talking about this really amazing tennis player, Jorn Borg, in the 1980s. And at 26, he just decided... I'm I'm burnt out and I no longer enjoy competitive tennis and I'm out. And he was out like he was out, out, like never to return was just was just done. And so McEnroe, he was talking to his brother on the Holding Court podcast. He said, I'm very concerned about our sport, even more so after what's transpired the last couple days. I thought that what Naomi did initially would give food for thought to the powers that be, but they felt they had to come back with something strong and intimidating, obviously. And what they did caused, to me, a lose-lose for everyone. He was also worried that in Naomi highlighting her mental health issues, that it may bring more scrutiny toward her. And he wasn't being mean or anything like that. He was just pointing out that, like, he's been around a while 
and he sees sometimes people use vulnerabilities against others, which I, which I think is a fair point. I hope it doesn't come to that. I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm, I'm fiercely protective of Naomi Osaka. One more thing about athletes and press conferences, because, you know, people are talking about it all over the Internet. And I've seen a frequent argument come up about the necessity of press conferences and how the sound bites from press conferences are important to building an athlete's celebrity. And this guy that I was discoursing with about it on a friend's page, he was like, athletes become mega superstars, not just because of how they play their sport, but because of the mythology, the story that is associated with the athlete. Seeing their personality, seeing their character, that is what the public is drawn to. And that's where the corporate endorsement deals come in that offer these seven and eight figure and sometimes nine figure endorsement deals. So his argument was, if they don't do press conferences, then how do they create this mythology? And he's right about the mythology part. He's totally right about the character and the story. And that's what creates the interest and the endorsement deals come from that. Totally, totally agree. And I think that there was a time when an athlete had to use traditional press in order to get their story out. But you don't have to do that in a social media era. Like just speaking about Naomi, she has 2.4 million followers on social media. All the quotes that press from around the world are getting from Naomi are because she's typing them in the notes on her phone and screenshotting them and uploading them to Instagram. At any given time, she can go live. She can put out a tweet. She can do a story. She can upload a picture. She can upload a whole damn documentary. Remember, Dave Chappelle was mad that, that the Dave Chappelle show was on Netflix and he wasn't getting a dime off of it. He made an aside about it when he was hosting Saturday Night Live. But then he made a 15-minute video that he uploaded to his Instagram account and YouTube. And millions of people watched it the day he did it. He didn't have to do a press conference. He just uploaded a video. And then traditional media all covered it and amplified what he did. His core fan base, the people who really love Dave Chappelle and would be watching Dave Chappelle on Netflix, he told them exactly what the problem was. Once you reach a certain level of celebrity, you don't need traditional media, certainly not press conferences, to create your own, to create your mythology. Like Beyonce. Beyonce dropped a whole album and didn't tell anybody. Dropped the album, everybody went and streamed it, downloaded it, bought it, whatever. And then traditional media picked it up on the back end. They amplified it. But the mythology, Beyonce creates her own. She don't talk. She'll do a cover story every once in a while when she has a big project. But that's not a press conference. She'll sit down and do a feature for a big magazine. She also dictates who shoots the covers and who writes the articles. A press conference is just one of the many ways that an athlete can engage with traditional media. Like in a Beyonce sense, like you can only do magazine features. You can speak with one reporter. You can have interviews one-on-one. It doesn't have to be an athlete sitting at a podium and a bunch of people with microphones and cameras screaming questions. That's not the only way to engage with the media. It's the way it's always been done, but it doesn't have to remain that way. And and I think expecting it to is being stuck in like turn of the century. We ain't got to do that no more. Maybe instead of talking to the athletes after every game, you speak to them at the end of a tournament or you speak to them every few days instead of every day. Maybe you do it virtual. Maybe you lessen the number of people in the room. Like the White House during COVID, they were like, okay, so these days y'all can come in, and then these days y'all can come in. There's so many possibilities of how the press and the public, because the press is supposed to represent the public, but there's so many other ways for traditional press and celebrities, athletes, to engage one another that's just, that's not a press conference. And I think that it's worth exploring, because with Naomi coming out and saying these press conferences give me anxiety A whole bunch of other people are like, yeah, nobody really likes that shit. You know who also really doesn't like that shit? I was thinking about this the other day. Everybody's favorite LeBron meme, when he picks up his bag and walks out, it's the meme everyone uses to convey that someone is over some bullshit. It's at a press conference. I don't don't remember what game it was, but a reporter was asking LeBron about his teammate's mindset 
during a play. And LeBron was like, how would I know that? Like, how would I know what someone else was thinking? Like, ask him. And then the reporter, like, doubled down and was like, well, what do you think he was thinking? And LeBron was like, I'm done. And he picked up his shit and walked out. It's not just Naomi. Everyone may not experience anxiety. Everyone may not be dealing with depression. But nobody really likes press conferences. Jamel Hill wrote a piece for The Atlantic today. And obviously, she's a sports journalist. She was like, I don't even like doing press conferences. She was like, quite honestly, I'd rather have a one-on-one with the athlete. I know that's not always possible, but it's preferable to standing in a room yelling questions at somebody. It was a good idea at one point, but perhaps we've evolved past it. If you are on the hunt for a really good gift, consider a wooden puzzle from Unidragon. You know how much I love puzzles. Unidragon puzzles are wonderful. A Unidragon puzzle is a great gift for a child, a friend, a parent, or even yourself. It's a stress reliever gift. It's also a gift that connects us to nature while we are surrounded by devices, the internet, and concrete. Unidragon puzzles are known for their colorful designs. They've got fabulous and memorable images of animals, tigers, wolves, pandas, unicorns, and so much more. Their beautiful art pieces are attractive and memorable for all ages. These puzzles also come with unique shapes and are made of the highest quality. They use laser cutting for the pieces, so all the parts perfectly fit together. If you're in the market for a really great puzzle, go to unidragon.com and use my code RATCHET for 10% off your first purchase. Last but certainly not least... We have some updates on Nicole Hannah-Jones and this UNC situation it has not yet been resolved. Her application for the job, the job that was supposed to give her tenure, has been resubmitted to the same board that declined her tenure the first time. I don't know how that's going to go. The school has been receiving a lot of pressure. I've seen stories both about how donors are continuing to give and then others who have pulled out. So I can't really get a read on how this situation has affected the giving. I also read that Hannah Jones and her legal team are exploring a lawsuit for job discrimination. So we'll see how that plays out. I also read that a highly respected chemist at the University of Maryland, my alma mater, I'm reading on the Huffington Post. Her name is Lisa Jones. She black. She was heavily recruited by UNC to join their chemistry department. But she turned the job down. She said, quote, the news this week that Nicole Hannah-Jones was denied tenure was very disheartening. It does not seem in line with a school that says it is interested in diversity. Although I know this decision may not reflect the view of the school's faculty, I will say that I cannot see myself accepting a position at a university where this decision stands. I appreciate all the effort you have put into trying to recruit me, but for me... This is hard to overlook. Faculty at UNC's chemistry department, they're pissed. They said they've been working for two years to recruit Jones. Members of the chemistry department released a statement. Jones' letter withdrawing her candidacy to join our faculty is a reflection of what our nation's minority scholars will be saying about UNC at Chapel Hill as they search for job opportunities or consider if this university is the right fit. Yep, sounds about right. I'm proud of Jones. I mean Lisa Jones, but Nicole Hannah Jones too. Because you know there's a type of black person that would have been like, yeah, I'm going to take the job. I'm not going to make a statement. I'm just going to get my money. But I guess sister chemist Lisa Jones is doing all right at the University of Maryland. I respect her for declining the opportunity. Good for her. They didn't learn yesterday. They're going to learn today. I hate watching this whole thing play out. Just give this lady tenure so we can all move on. How you going to have a whole Pulitzer Prize, a Peabody Award, and a MacArthur Genius Grant and can't get tenure? Really? Y'all just making shit difficult for no damn reason. I mean, racism is your reason. But it's stupid. Just give this lady her tenure. So that's the episode for this week. If you've not yet picked up your Don't Waste Your Pretty merch, please do so. It's available on DemetriaLLucas.com. We have the pink tees. We have the white tees. 
And then we have the white and gold V-neck shirt. If you haven't picked one up, please do. Quantities are running low. I'm not going to restock those until the next news for Don't Waste Your Pretty comes out. I'm still working on the Ratchet and Respectable stuff. I can't get the logo the way that I want it. The actual logo that I use for the podcast doesn't look right on a shirt. I'm having some transference issues. But we shall figure it out in due time. If you need some Ratchet and Respectable in your life between now and next week, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Demetria L. Lucas, two L's. And if you want to tune in for my conversation with Tia Williams, author of Seven Days in June, I'm going to post that information in the stories of my Instagram page so you can register for free and learn more about Tia and her amazing new book. So proud of her. We will talk again on Tuesday. Okay, bye. 